Welcome to Once Upon a Coin, documenting the ongoing history of blockchain and cryptocurrency. And as always, I'm your storyteller, Jason Cassidy. Today's story has us going back in time to a bygone era, one which many considered to be the very birth of cryptocurrency itself. This is where it all began, with an idea that was so powerful that it would one day take the entire planet by storm. This is the story of crypto in 2009. Sun cast a shadow, a digital line is coming over the mountain and over your mind. If you've been around in crypto since the very beginning, then this episode is probably going to put a smile on your face. Since the industry was so small back in 2009, there wasn't very much reporting on it at all. And conversely, if you're relatively new to the space, then you are in for a real treat today because you're going to learn about the origins of Bitcoin and every single thing that came along after it. We'll start off our journey by addressing the Bitcoin white paper, which was released the year prior on October 31st, 2008 by the mysterious creator who went by the alias of Satoshi Nakamoto. This set the table for what was eventually to come just a few months later once the calendar flipped over to 2009 when Satoshi officially released the Bitcoin blockchain on January 3rd. It's worth noting that Bitcoin was a fair launch that the public was given ample notice about ahead of time. There was no ICO or initial coin offering, no pre-sale, pre-mine, or even a launch party involved. Satoshi wanted everyone to have the same opportunity to get involved in Bitcoin when it came to the mining perspective. And in the very beginning, before there were any exchanges trading Bitcoin, if you wanted to get your hands on some, then you had to mine it just like Satoshi was. The Genesis block, or block zero, was the first block ever generated on the Bitcoin blockchain. And because Satoshi wanted to make things as fair as possible, he even hardcoded into the protocol that the Genesis block reward of 50 Bitcoin was unspendable. Satoshi really did do just about everything in his power to signal to the public that this was a fair and transparent technology open to all. A lot of research has taken place since Bitcoin's inception into how Satoshi launched the technology and how he put an emphasis on it being fair. And I would encourage you to take a look into exactly how he did this and his intentions because there was a lot of little Easter eggs and nuances into how this technology was released. This was a critically important aspect of Bitcoin's early success creating as wide a distribution of coins as possible to ensure that too many Bitcoin didn't fall into too few hands early on. Keep in mind that back in early 2009, there really weren't many people mining Bitcoin outside of Satoshi himself. So putting all this effort into ensuring that the public was aware of the technology and encouraging more people to join in and mine it really did help set the groundwork for this being seen as a legitimate new type of financial technology. So slowly but surely, more people heard about Bitcoin and joined in from the mining perspective, and this helped raise both the hash rate and difficulty of mining a Bitcoin. This was a sign that the network was actually growing. Believe it or not, back then, the network had such a low hash rate that you could actually win a block of Bitcoin with just a plain old laptop or desktop PC. The network was that young. And what this meant was that if you were involved in Bitcoin back in 2009, then you could have easily acquired a copious amount of Bitcoin from almost nothing when you look at it from the power consumption perspective. This is in stark contrast to what the mining industry looks like today, where you have literally $100 million mining operations that are working in temperature controlled warehouses with thousands of ASIC machines, which is application specific integrated circuit. These are mining hardware devices that are specialized in mining cryptocurrency and it's big business. But back in 2009, this is all just a hobby. The community that formed around Bitcoin in the early days was mostly comprised of libertarian minded people who related to the principles that were expunged in the Bitcoin white paper. You need not look any further for evidence of this than the Genesis block itself, which had a message embedded in it as Satoshi cited a newspaper article that was discussing the possibility of a second round of bailouts for the banking industry. This clearly set the tone for the anti-establishment nature of Bitcoin, etched forever in the Bitcoin blockchain for all to see if they question the veracity of Satoshi's intentions. The message was clear. Satoshi was not happy with the imploding fiat-based banking system 
and wanted to offer an alternative in the form of Bitcoin. And with its limited supply and transparent economics, he was hoping that people would see this as a life raft in a rapidly rising tide. Perspective is everything. Remember, this is 2009 and the 2007 and 8 financial collapse had just happened, impacting Satoshi and a lot of other early adopters. And this is likely both the impetus for Satoshi creating Bitcoin and why it was such a success early on. For myself, this rings true. As I was several years into a career at BlackBerry at the time, and I was watching my RRSP, or the Canadian version of 401k, get absolutely decimated during the meltdown on Wall Street. Having just lost a large part of what I was planning on being my long-term nest egg, I was not only motivated to figure out what the heck just happened, but I wanted to find out a better solution for the future as well. After barely surviving the disastrous events of the 2007-2008 financial collapse, most of us were just trying to look for a more ethical, honest and transparent form of money. Suffice to say, if you were involved in Bitcoin circa 2009 to 2013, then there's a pretty damn good chance that you were involved in Bitcoin because of your principles, just as much as the prospect of getting rich. And for the very earliest of Bitcoin adopters, this was more of an ideological move than anything else. Some truly historical events took place once Satoshi had finally released his grand creation to the world. Hal Finney, a programmer and early adopter of the technology, was the lucky recipient of 10 Bitcoin, which he received from Satoshi himself on January 12th. This took place in Block 170 and is recognized as the very first Bitcoin transaction ever. To highlight the libertarian-focused community that is formed around Bitcoin at the onset, we can look at two other early adopters, one being Wei Dai, the creator of Bitcoin predecessor B-Money, and Nick Zabo, the creator of Bitcoin predecessor Bitgold. These are quite literally legends of the cypherpunk movement. So to have them as early adopters and supporters of your technology is probably a hint that you're going in the right direction. As the year progressed, more and more people were downloading the Bitcoin blockchain and taking part in the network, whether that was just to actually use the vault and play around with its features or to take a more serious approach and get involved in the mining game. One of the real challenges that existed around this time was actually acquiring Bitcoin. Because if you weren't willing to get involved in the mining process, then you were pretty much SOL. And this is because there was no established value for Bitcoin yet and it wasn't traded on any exchanges. This problem can be boiled down to one harsh reality, that in the early days, Bitcoin wasn't being used as a currency at all. It was completely speculative. And this is in contrast to how it is treated today as a global financially traded asset. But before Bitcoin could be traded, it had to have a value, which meant it had to have a universally recognized and accepted price in fiat currency. A lot of people were starting to ask the question, how can I buy some Bitcoin? And the challenge, of course, was that no one knew how to accurately value it yet. Well, this all changed on October 12th, when Finnish programmer Marty Melmi sold 5,050 Bitcoin for a grand total of $5.02 US. This gave one Bitcoin a value of 0.0009 of a penny. Yeah. If you're thinking like you might have a heart attack with what you just heard, keep in mind that this is 2009. And while people were very excited about the potential for Bitcoin's future one day as a currency, that's all it was at this point. It was just potential. It had no real value yet. All the same, this was a vitally important first step in Bitcoin's progression as a legitimate currency because it was the first recorded sale. And this finally gave people an exchange rate to go off of. And with this act, the horses were now officially out of the barn. And you would slowly but surely see exchanges popping up allowing people to buy and sell Bitcoin, even if it was only worth fractions of a penny at this point. Of course, to spread the word about Bitcoin, Satoshi would have to find an online watering hole where he could connect with people and share his ideas. When Satoshi first introduced the world to Bitcoin back in early 2009, he did so via the SourceForge forums, where people could download the client software and actually have a direct conversation with Satoshi. However, by the fall of that year, Satoshi felt that the Bitcoin movement had grown so fast, so quick, that it actually had outgrown the SourceForge forum. A new online place that people could gather and meet would be required to take Bitcoin to the next level. And thus, on November 22nd, the Bitcoin Talk Forum officially became the new home for Bitcoin, as Satoshi announced this relocation plan to his growing fan base. This turned out to be a very good move, as the Bitcoin Talk Forum would go on to help facilitate just about every need the community would have when it came to Bitcoin. 
The form resonated so well with the public that if you can believe it or not, it's still in existence to this very day. And I highly recommend that you check it out because the form is steeped in history and has some very cool information for you to discover. In fact, this subject is so important to the history of crypto and there's so much awesome stuff that happens on the forum, we actually made an entire episode about this, so you should check it out. Bitcoin was looking in pretty good shape all of a sudden because it now had a price that it could be traded at, but more importantly, it had a new home that would help facilitate the growth of the technology in the coming years. As the year of 2009 was coming to a close, we can see that despite the ups and downs it had over the previous 12 months, it ended on a high note, setting itself up for a pretty good 2010. And what a year 2010 was. And that's exactly what we're gonna be looking at in the next episode, so I highly encourage you to check out the story of crypto in 2010. I hope you enjoyed today's stroll down memory lane. Until next time, have fun and enjoy life, my friends. I'll be back soon with another incredible story to tell you.